Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I know you have a lot of choices for how to spend your time on campus and appreciate you being here in real time. I know people have intentions of being in real time and then punt to the video. So you get extra bonus points for being here. And you also have the added benefit of being able to ask questions in real time, which will make for a good discussion at the end. Uh, my name is Alicia Seiger. I'm the Managing Director of the Sustainable Finance Initiative at Stanford, which is part of the Door School for Sustainability. Uh, and I am very pleased and have the privilege of introducing my colleague, Ju Julian Mav, who is going to um, uh, put me through the ringer trying to pronounce all kinds of French names and sc of his schools and things, which, as I confess, my, my high school French teacher would be horrified to hear me try and uh, do here. So forgive me. But Julian is a research fellow um, at the Sustainable Finance Initiative. He received his master's degree in economics from Ecole Polytechnique and NCI and HEC Paris and graduated from ENS, which he explained to me, these are all small schools that collaborate together um, on, on various master's uh, programs. So multiple institutions coming together to, to, uh, to make up his degree. He previously held research positions at the World Bank, the Peterson Institute for International Economics, and was involved in various research projects at UC Berkeley and MIT Sloan. And I'm so excited about the topic uh, he's gonna cover today. It is near and dear to all of our hearts um, and, and by, in terms of folks who've been tracking the climate action story and in particular, the evolution of, of the narrative of uh, big oil and gas as the kind of primary um, obstruction and uh, uh, target of climate action to financial institutions becoming um, squarely uh, in the crosshairs as, as both uh, potential obstructions, but also as, as potential targets for, for driving change. And so this theory of change that has evolved over the last decade has been one of um, optimism that, that financial institutions can accelerate de global decarbonization by aligning portfolios with Paris uh, targets and transition pathways. And there has been a lot of momentum around this theory of change. And while um, the, the end goal is one we all share, our, our team started to, to dig into questions about the efficacy of this theory of change and the, and the data sources, tools, and frameworks that, that undergird it. And so this presentation Julian is going to walk us through can traces the progression um, of, of action from uh, the use of IPCC scenarios to corporate target setting using the science-based targets initiative primarily, although there are others which we'll walk through, and, and employing um, uh, financial institutions portfolio alignment methods, this, this collection of, of uh, tactics uh, exposes four flaws um, and, and that, are, that are essentially critical weaknesses in this theory of change. And those are, um, the, the unstable foundation of emissions counting as opposed to uh, rigorous accounting, a reliance on centrally planned pathways, implicit divestment driven approaches, and potential tensions with fiduciary duties. And these are all issues that, that, that Julian and our team uncovered in research uh, that that really call into question the ultimate efficacy of this theory of change of financial institutions. The good news is there is an alternative pathway, and that pathway is along the lines of, of the work we've been doing with emissions liability management, which treats emissions as liabilities to be matched by removal assets, allowing firms to maintain emission solvency so that rather than chasing these pathways, ELM provides incentives for emissions reductions and removals consistent with shareholder obligations. So that's the that's the abstract, if you will. Julian's going to take us through in detail this paper, the research, um, and our findings. And we look forward to your questions and discussion at the end. And Julian, take it away. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you, Alicia, for the introduction. Uh, I'm pleased uh, to present you today uh, our paper, uh, co-authored with Mark Huston, Alicia Seiger, and Tom Heller. Uh, pathways versus incentives, uh, climate activism to climate outcome. Uh, in the past few years, uh, financial institutions uh, 
have become the primary targets of uh, climate activists and various stakeholders, such as NGOs, regulators, etc., to accelerate global decarbonization. Behind lies a theory of change. Under stakeholder pressure and regulatory oversight, financial institutions might effectively incentivize decarbonization by lining up portfolios with Paris aligned pathways, targets, and plans. The theory of change underpins the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, GFANS. GFANS is a global coalition composed of financial institutions, such as banks, asset owners, asset managers. And GFANS was created during COP26 in Glasgow in 2021. And GFANS has become uh, the leader for financial institution in terms of climate finance. By September 2023, GFANS has assembled more than 550 financial institutions across 50 countries and representing more than $150 trillion of assets under management. So in our paper, we aim to understand the progression from the Paris Agreement to GFANS and financial institutions as change agents. So to understand this, we analyze carefully each step. So first, the Paris Agreement sets constraint on rising temperatures, stay below 2 degrees and ideally be below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Second, the IPCC and the IEA uh, develop climate scenarios and sectoral transition pathways by allocating a carbon budget across the global economy. Third, the Science-Based Targets Initiative, SBTI, step in to facilitate alignment of corporate net zero targets consistent with transition pathways. And fourth, uh, GFANS now oversees, uh, in cooperation with uh, the various groups such as SBTI, the Transition Plan Task Force, a common framework for financial institutions implementing net zero targets of their own. In our paper, we, were, we raised uh, two key questions. Is setting climate targets informed by transition pathways an effective strategy to reduce carbon emissions? And can the financial sector drive down car uh, carbon emissions by aligning portfolios with sectoral transition pathways? So my presentation uh, is composed of three uh, sections. In the first section, uh, I will explain the foundations uh, for setting uh, climate targets. Um, and also I will review how financial institutions attempt to align their portfolios with transition pathways. I will also uh, present uh, the transition pathway initiative metric as that aims to assess uh, the progress made by companies in terms of transition. And I will also review the transition plan task force uh, that provides guidance to firms on how they should disclose a strategy to achieve their climate targets. In the second section, I will provide an evaluation of current practice regarding transition pathways. And specifically in our paper, we identify uh, four key issues. The first issue is uh, a flawed carbon accounting system. Uh, the second issue is related to centrally uh, planned pathways that lack some flexibility. The third issue is related to implicit divestment strategies uh, that uh, portfolio alignment uh, entails. And the fourth and last weakness we identify is related to fiduciary obligations and the fact that current practice uh, doesn't consider uh, trade-offs that are at play with emissions reductions. And in the third section, uh, I will present emissions liability management as a system that overcomes the challenges presented in section two. And ELM also uh, enables uh, to drive down uh, carbon emissions for companies and financial institutions. So first, corporate targets and portfolio alignment. So the goal of this section is twofold. First, I will describe the basis for corporate target setting aligned with transition pathways and scenarios. And second, I will describe financial institution specific measures of target setting and alignment as a theory of change. This figure uh, summarizes uh, the foundations for transition pathways. So the two key elements are uh, the definition of a global carbon budget and sectoral pathways 
And the second element is the carbon accounting system developed by the GAG protocol. So these foundations uh, inform uh, corporate sector targets and portfolio alignment tools. I will also present uh, the TPI metric for progress evaluation and planning frameworks as developed by the transition plan uh, task force TPT. So there are a lot of acronyms involved uh, in this field of uh, transition pathways, and I will try to explain them, explain their role, and explain how they are uh, interrelated. So first, corporate targets. So SBTI, the science-based target initiative, sets a standard for aligning companies' targets with emission reduction pathways. Over the recent years, um, the number of companies with SBTI-approved target has dramatically increased. And in 2023, there were around 3,000 companies with SBTI-approved targets. So SBTI is really a major player, player of um, climate disclosures. Uh, specifically, uh, the SBTI strategy uh, takes as given a global carbon budget uh, defined by the IPCC, so the aggregate net emissions are liable to limit temperature rise with some probability. So for instance, 1.5 degree with 50% probability. Then SBTI takes an emission scenario uh, developed by the IPCC or the IEM. So the carbon budget distribution through time and across sectors. And finally, SBTI provides an allocation uh, method, so how carbon budget is allocated across companies that inform how they should um, define their climate targets over different time horizons. Uh, so more precisely, as BTI com compliant firms uh, can use one of two methods to set their own targets. The first method is the absolute contraction approach, a ACM, and in this case, um, it requires, uh, this method requires companies to reduce their absolute emissions at the same rate, so at least 4.2% every year. And this method applies to sectors lacking technological pathways for decarbonization. So one example is the apparel and footwear sector. The second method that companies can use to define their climate targets is provided uh, by the sectoral is called the Sectoral Decarbonization Approach, SDA. And this method requires each company within the same sector to reduce its emission intensity to a specific level by 2050. So in this case, emission intensity corresponds uh, to uh, total emissions of a company divided by an output unit depending on the sector in which uh, this company operates. So for instance, in the case of the power sector, the output unit is a uh, megajoule. The sectoral decarbonization approach applies to sector with well-defined technological pathways uh, and the scenarios uh, have been developed by the IEM. And one sector, uh, for instance, is a power sector that can use uh, this approach. Moreover, the Transition Pathway Initiative that is hosted by the London School of Economics provides a complementary approach to SBTI. The TPI uh, offers a carbon performance matrix that evaluates corporate alignment with sectoral pathways in the short, medium, and long term. This figure illustrates a TPI carbon performance matrix for a sample of companies in the oil and gas uh, sector. So companies disclose their climate targets at different time horizons, 2050, 2040, 2050. And these climate targets for each company are represented by the dotted lines. And uh, between each uh, date for climate target, a line is drawn. And then these dotted lines are, are compared to uh, some scenarios, so national pledges, uh, a below two degree scenario, and a 1.5 degree uh, scenario uh, for the oil and gas sector. Here, the key uh, unit is emissions intensity, so carbon emissions divided by megajoule. And this figure shows that according to TPI metric, none of uh, these uh, oil and gas companies are aligned, at least in the short term, with a 1.5 degree trajectory. And also this figure illustrates 
pretty well the concept of uh, transition pathways and being aligned with them. And now portfolio alignment. So portfolio alignment for a financial institution requires metrics allowing aggregation of underlying corporate targets. Uh, financial institutions follow three steps to align their portfolio. First, as they choose a climate metric. So it can be uh, absolute emissions, emissions intensity, implied temperature rise, etc. I will uh, define implied temperature rise in the next slide. Uh, then the second step corresponds to the choice of a climate scenario, so either from the IPCC or the IEM. And then finally, financial uh, institutions based on a climate metric and on, the, and on a climate scenario define a climate target uh, for their portfolio or for a certain time horizon. So for instance, 2030 or 2050. Uh, SBTI uh, offers a guidance for financial institutions, and this guidance parallels uh, transition pathways for other sectors. SBTI makes a distinction between operational emissions and finance emissions. Uh, for financial institutions, operational emissions corresponds to emissions related, for instance, to the energy consumed uh, in their building or also the travels of their employees. But for financial institutions, finance emissions are far more important. And SBTI proposes three options uh, to align uh, financial portfolios. The first option is called the sectoral decarbonization approach applied at the portfolio level. So in this case, financial institutions uh, estimate their finance emissions, then they choose a scenario and then define a target for their finance emissions at a certain time horizon. The second option proposed by SBTI corresponds to the portfolio coverage approach. So for instance, uh, a financial institution can decide that 50% uh, of companies in its portfolio must have uh, SBTI approved targets uh, in 2030. And the third option proposed by SBTI is a temperature rating approach. So in this case, financial institutions uh, develop uh, methods uh, to establish a relationship between uh, corporate targets and a global temperature. And so when, and then uh, financial institutions aggregate the corporate, uh, corporate targets in their portfolio and then can define the temperature associated with their uh, portfolio. So for instance, a financial institution can claim that its portfolio is aligned with a 1.5 or 1.7 or 2 degree trajectory. But of course, uh, this method requires uh, strong assumptions and is surrounded by uh, significant uncertainty. In addition to SBTI, GFANS has proposed four tools to evaluate the alignment of financial portfolio with the Paris goal. And GFANS emphasizes the need to engage over divestment. But the tool proposed uh, by GFANS often falls short of uh, reaching this objective of engagement. So the first GFANS tool uh, is a binary target metric. So this tool, this tool is really similar uh, as a SBTI portfolio coverage. And it encourages increasing target setting for a portfolio's holdings. The second defense tool is the implied temperature rise metric, and it's the same as the SBTI temperature rating approach. The third defense tool is a benchmark divergence metric, and it compares the company's projected cumulative emissions with a sector specific benchmark. And it helps financial institutions to identify under and overshooting reductions at the portfolio level. And the final defense tools uh, assign companies based on quantitative and qualitative factors such as criteria of stated targets, past performance, disclosure, and governance. And so each company is assigned uh, a category, so align, aligning, committed to aligning, or not aligned. PACTA so stands for uh, Paris Agreement Capital Transition Assessment. And PACTA is a tool now owned by the Rocky Mountain Institute. 
And PACTA is technology focused and it helps financial institutions to align their portfolio. Uh, PACTA takes a bottom-up approach linking financial instruments to specific physical assets. So for instance, a first particular steel smelting technology. A PACTA favors engagement over divestment. Why? Because PACTA departs from uh, targeting finance emissions and PACTA is focused on the deployment of clean technologies. So the key difference between PACTA and SBTI for financial institutions is that PACTA is really focused on uh, clean technology and doesn't consider finance emissions. Uh, the Transition Plan Task Force is a new initiative uh, led by the United Kingdom, uh, and it helps to define transition plans for companies and financial institutions. So many companies have set climate targets, but few provide clarity into transition plans for achieving targets. And TPT has emerged as a leading force providing clarity and guidance into transition plans to meet targets. The TPT framework is composed of five key elements. The first element is foundations. So in this element, companies uh, disclose their objectives in terms of climate transition and also describe their business model. The second key element in the TPT framework is implementation strategy. And companies uh, disclose details on how they will reach their climate targets. The third element is the engagement strategy. And Companies disclose, should disclose some elements regarding how they should engage with their value chain and also government and various stakeholders. The so fourth element in the TPT framework corresponds to metrics and targets, and the fifth element corresponds to governance. And the TPT framework relies heavily on the concept of transition pathways and SBTI climate targets. So in this first section, uh, I describe the foundations of um, transition pathways. I describe how companies define their climate targets and how financial institutions attempt to align their financial portfolios with transition pathways. Also describe progress evaluation uh, as proposed by TPI and planning framework proposed by TPT. Uh, now in the second section, uh, I will uh, evaluate the current practice. So it's clear that corporate target methods and portfolio alignment tools share core characteristics. However, in our paper, we identify four key uh, weaknesses. The first one is faulty carbon accounting. The second one is inflexible centrally planned pathways. The third one is implicit divestment strategies. And the fourth one is difficult to reconcile conflicts with fiduciary obligations. Current practice relies on unstable GHG protocol foundations. So SBTI targets are expressed in terms of scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. Scope one corresponds to direct emissions. A scope two corresponds to emissions from purchase electricity, steam, heating, and cooling and scope three emissions correspond to upstream and downstream uh, activities. But uh, the GHG protocol methodology raises serious credibility concerns. Only scope one emissions enters the atmosphere. Scope two attempts to count another firm's emissions attributed to purchase electricity, but in fact fall short, only counting a subset of combustion emissions as demonstrated by a recent paper written by Mark Rosson, Alicia Seiger, and Abby Mathieson. Moreover, scope three, due to ambiguous boundaries and implementation discretion, overcomes emissions, as proven by Kaplan and Ramana and uh, Mark Rosson. Uh, the second weakness uh, with current practice uh, corresponds to central planning. So transition pathways fail a reasonable test of robustness because they depend on exogenously specified deterministic technological diffusion, and also because they do not depend on endogenous investment decisions or capital allocation. So transition pathways uh, represent one possible path for emissions, economic activity, and technological 
uh, diffusion, but it's one possible path among different. And so transition pathways lack some flexibility. Moreover, initiatives such as SBTI have slowly repurposed climate scenario as normative pathways, despite their origins as policy tools. So initially climate scenarios were developed to understand the impact of climate policies, such as a carbon tax on carbon emissions and uh, economic activity. So SBTI treats uh, scenarios as deterministic and not uh, as flexible drivers of incentives and investments. And for this reason, uh, current practice regarding transition pathways falls short of its objective of reducing carbon emissions. Moreover, under SBTI sectoral decarbonization approach, firm carbon intensities converge to sector targets by 2050. So financial institutions might identify holdings deviating from these pathways. But identifying deviations does not inform effective decision making for investors, and they tend to favor divestment strategies, as I will explain in more detail in the next slide. Moreover, the global emissions budget allocation defining sectoral transition pathways does not allow for economic or financial variation. So for instance, the allocation of the carbon budget might not consider adequately the barriers that developing countries face to reduce their emissions. So the definition of uh, climate scenarios and the transition pathways may be in very inadequate to reduce global emissions. The third weakness uh, corresponds to implicit divestment strategies for financial institutions. So current practice uh, by focusing on finance emissions tends to favor divestment over engagement. And it's important to note that the reduction of finance emissions does not necessarily translate into a reduction of actual emissions. So financial institutions by following current practice are really focused on finance emission, uh, but by divesting from the most emitting firms uh, doesn't mean that uh, we reduce global emissions. And so re some recent empirical studies show that uh, strategies undertaken by financial institutions uh, to achieve the climate goals fall short of uh, this objective. So one interesting paper uh, is the one of Arsmark and Shu, and the authors show empirically that higher cost of capital hinders brown firms' ability to fund decarbonization and encourages them to maintain returns by worsening the emissions profile in the near term. So if companies face higher capital costs, so it's less likely that they will invest in clean technologies. Moreover, focusing on further greening uh, relatively green firms may appear effective on a firm by firm basis, but has limited uh, effect on the aggregate system. And the four weakness we identify uh, corresponds to fiduciary obligations. So Paris aligned firms must confront their oblig obligations to pursue climate goals while maximizing shareholder value over a given time horizon. Moreover, asset managers must reconcile climate goals with obligations to serve their client interests. So to be clear, reducing emissions to ensure long-term sustainability of individual firms portfolios or even clients supports global interest. However, emissions reductions beyond a certain threshold involves trade-offs with fiduciary obligations. So if a company or portfolio manager significantly decreases its emissions, footprint or financing in the short run, then short run performance may suffer. And current approaches to corporate or financial institutions alignment ignore these trade-offs and so likely jeopardizes a success. So to, over to overcome fiduciary concerns, companies and financial institutions must be clear about their approach to climate risk, explaining trade-offs between climate risk, long-term opportunities, and near-term returns. So to summarize, uh, this uh, figure illustrates the weaknesses of uh, current practice regarding transition pathways. So we saw the issue of central planning related to the definition of climate scenarios. We also mentioned uh, the invalid accounting uh, and the GHG protocol. 
and I also explain uh, the divestment strategies that are um, incentivized by current portfolio alignment tools and the fiduciary obligations uh, issue. Uh, to illustrate the limits of current practice, uh, I would like to take the, uh, the example of two companies. Um, so Intel declined to participate uh, in uh, SBTI and specifically Intel said that while Intel, Intel long term net zero GHG goals are in line with a 1.5 degree emission reduction scenario required by SBTI, uh, Intel is challenged by the near-term reduction requirement without the ability to account for significant historical reductions. It's important to note that Intel's absolute emissions aren't decreasing, so that's why they cannot apply to a SBTI target, but its manufacturing output triple over the recent years. And so the Intel example illustrates the issue of central planning. So several pathways are possible to achieve climate goals and pathways proposed by SBTI might be not adequate for some companies. Intel also illustrates the issue of fiduciary obligations because in the short run, uh, Intel has to provide uh, chips to its uh, clients. The second example to illustrate the limits of current practice is uh, given by Amazon. So Amazon recently lost its SBTI approval. And Amazon said that uh, it's difficult for them to submit to SBTI in a meaningful and accurate way. So it might reflect the carbon accounting issue because uh, with the current uh, GHG protocol, it's very difficult. Companies cannot uh, estimate in an accurate manner the carbon emissions. And also the example of Amazon can illustrate the central planning issue because Amazon is a very complex uh, business and SBTI and transition pathways currently proposed may not be very well adapted to uh, Amazon uh, activities. Uh, and now I will start my uh, third section on emissions liability management. So I've shown that climate target setting and portfolio alignment have fundamental challenges that will continue to limit practitioners' ability to achieve desired outcomes. In this section, I present ELM as a robust and effective approach to accelerate decarbonization. ELM relies on the well-understood financial tools of asset liability matching, and thus ELM incentivizes companies and financial institutions to move from climate disclosures to climate actions. But the first step is to fix carbon accounting. So climate transition requires a system of transparent and expedient information sharing. Kaplan and Ramana in a foundational paper developed the e-liability method as a functional carbon accounting system. So basically they apply principle of cost accounting to carbon emissions, passing actual emissions from supplier to customer in a similar fashion to the transfer of goods and services. Uh, this slide illustrates the e-liability approach. So the, basi the basic idea is to measure our carbon emissions at the product level rather than at the entity level. So if we consider two companies, A and B, uh, the e-liabilities for company A are calculated the following. So it's the addition of start of period e-liability plus purchase e-liability plus produce e-liability. Then company A transfers uh, e-liabilities to company B. And then in the same manner as company A, we can calculate e-liabilities for company B. And company B can transfer some of its e-liabilities to end use uh, consumer. So this is uh, the logic of the e-liability approach. Uh, e-liability accounting maintains consistency at any level of aggregation across a supply chain at a regional, national, or global level. With the e-liability system, carbon emissions are accounting once and only once. And so e-liability accounting enables financial institutions to accurately calculate finance emissions, and also it helps uh, financial institutions to compare uh, companies in terms of carbon emissions. And this is not the case with uh, the GHG protocol. Um, now, emissions liability management. 
So Mark Roston, Alicia Seiger, and Tom Heller uh, propose ELM as a method that equates a net zero claim with carbon balance sheet solvency. So ELM is the next step after uh, e-liability. So carbon emissions create long duration liabilities called e-liabilities that a firm must defease with duration match carbon removal assets. So with ELM, companies uh, build a carbon balance sheet in which they match uh, carbon liabilities with uh, carbon assets. And so with ELM, the market price of durable removals provides a price signal to internalize the externality of emissions. So when a company emits emissions, it creates an externality. And according to economic theory, uh, companies have to internalize uh, this uh, externality. And so ELM provides uh, such incentives. So with ELM, a company has two options. The first option is to emit carbons and have e-liabilities, but then the company has to buy carbon removals to extinguish these e-liabilities. And for most companies, uh, this strategy is very expensive because uh, durable uh, removals are very expensive. So the second strategy that uh, companies can take is to reduce uh, the emissions of their activity. So ELM defines a positive outcome, no additional atmospheric uh, carbon emissions that leads to effective emissions reductions. Uh, regarding capital allocation, so ELM does not tie firms' risk to particular climate scenarios. So contrary to current practice regarding transition pathways, ELM offers a flexibility. ELM also builds on the way financial institutions uh, think about capital allocation. And so ELM corresponds to an additional source of capital expenses. So for a company uh, with a lot of e-liabilities, uh, this company uh, will be seen by financial investors as very risky because this company will have to uh, consume a lot of capital to invest in carbon removals to extinguish uh, e-liabilities. Uh, moreover, ELM provides a sound basis for stakeholder engagement. Uh, financial institutions may pressure uh, capital allocation uh, toward emissions reductions, and activists and aligned financial investors could pressure firms to increase their stated liability duration. So what does it mean? So when a company emits carbon, uh, carbon remains in the atmosphere, the atmosphere for many, many, many years. And so in practice, at the beginning, if companies decide to implement ELM, they might choose um, some uh, carbon removals with a duration of 50, 100 years, but with a duration that is shorter than the duration required to completely extinguish uh, e liabilities. And so activists and financial investors really can put pressure to increase the stated liability durations of companies. Uh, to conclude, uh, current practice defining transition pathways faces fundamental challenges. So the reliance on flow carbon accounting methods, rigid and technological prescribed pathways, implicit divestment strategies, and tension with fiduciary obligations. Uh, the current theory of change is unlikely to fulfill its promises of emissions reductions. And so we need to move forward uh, and to adopt methods that enable real emissions reduction. And ELM and carbon solvency provide a sound basis for climate action. The market price of durable carbon removals incentivizes emission reductions and reframing climate risk in terms of capital requirements, cost of capital and asset liability management aligns with financial institution expertise. To conclude, ELM offers a more robust strategy to activate financial markets as change agents. Uh, thank you for your attention and I would be happy to answer your questions. Terrific work, Julian, and thank you all for sticking with us. It is a lot of content walking through the full landscape of portfolio alignment tools, a thorough investigation of the ways in which they are going to struggle to add up, and then the introduction of two big new concepts around 
rigorous carbon accounting and emissions liability management. And as you heard me fumble through a few words in French at the beginning, Julian has done this all researching in, other, in, in a non-native language and writing in it too, which is really truly remarkable. So thank you, Julian. While we're, while we're waiting for folks to get warmed up, Mark, did you wanna chime in? You looked, and I see Holmes as a hand raised. Holmes, go ahead. Nice to see you. Thank you. For <laughs> Uh, thanks. I didn't have my my video on, but I was screenshotting madly so that I could uh, return um, and, and tap through again without watching the video. Uh, Dylan, thank you for laying out in step by step fashion, just as Alicia made, paid the compliment. One thing that uh, a person like myself climbing a steep learning curve to catch you on the journey would benefit from is a kind of illustration or a demonstration of the dance moves. And I wonder if you're able to do that by reference. For example, you had at different times acknowledged um, uh, potentially there are good examples in the footwear industry. I saw that at one point. Could, could you name for us individual corporations or contexts in which we would recognize these tools being used in the sequence you've described? Uh, so, so basically what uh, companies do is in their sustainability reports, they say that they aim to achieve some climate targets by 2030, and usually it's approved by some, uh, by SBTI. Um, I don't have all the names of companies with uh, SBTI targets, but really it works uh, at, uh, at the sector level. So basically SBTI has developed guidance for uh, each sector and to inform how these companies can define their, their climate targets. Homes added ELM adopters. But so, so for instance, for each sector, uh, SBTI recommends one of the two approach. So the ACS or reducing uh, the absolute emissions for sector without technological pathways. And uh, the second method is the sectoral decarbonization approach and really focus on the carbon intensity of companies. So. Depending on the sector, companies can choose one of these two methods. I'm not sure I, under, I answer correctly your question. Yeah, Holmes, maybe I'll, I'll jump in a little bit here too. And Aaron, I was wondering if that was the real Aaron Craig. Aaron, <laughs> nice to see you. Um, so we actually have a case study, and I was looking around to see if XJ's jumped in on here, but he's not. He's a recent MSX graduate who who took the deep dive into the case study of this analysis, which shows how a tire company, uh, Pirelli Tire, was able to get SBTI targets approved for their um, operations by um, looking at their scope one and two emissions, because scope three is, is considered essentially out of scope and optional for a downstream tire manufacturer. The problem is, of course, the conflation with upstream and downstream scope three. So the long story short on the target setting is because of um, the, com the confusion around scopes, Pirelli is able to set a target that doesn't look at its largest sources of emissions upstream because those are scope three. And so the target that they're able to set is, is so much lower than what they really could and should do and have control over. And they were able to get approval for a target that was lower than the stated um, minimums at SBTI. We don't say this to be critical of any of the companies involved. It's just like how this is happening in practice. Um, and so you've got this kind of perverse and uh, outcomes through the existing process with SBTI target setting and approvals missing kind of the biggest pieces of the decarbonization opportunity for particular companies. And then in this case study, we walk through how e-liability accounting gives you the information you need to understand the emissions from supply chains and how ELM applying carbon solvency through specific duration would, how what the impact would be on EBITDA for that company were it to be carbon solvent for particular durations. What is not captured in that case study is the fact that it, it, it that is if if the tire company if Pirelli were to balance all of its liabilities with with duration matched assets and do no investment in decarbonization in its supply chain. So it's actually 
the findings of this case study actually are the the high watermark of what these costs would be because presumably they would invest in the cheaper alternatives of decarbonizing the supply chain and not own that liability in the first place. But we have a piece of work that that essentially answers your questions in very vivid detail that is dotting I's and crossing T's, um, but we don't have it yet to share. Thank you for taking us through the journey we can look forward to. Yeah, thank you. Aaron, nice to see you. Thank you, nice to see you also. Um, uh, I'll just say briefly that I, I come from a standpoint of working with companies broadly um, to measure and then take action on their footprints. And I, I think the e-liability, I've been following this for a little while in, in the background. So, and I think the, the e-liability concept, right? The, the notion um, of, of uh, having a comparable system that you do for financial accounting, it's easy to understand, it's easy to communicate, people can immediately understand how it could be impactful. Like it has lots of things going for it. Um, and, and also all of the, the issues with SPTI, even that aside. The challenge, a big challenge I see, and I'm curious if you're working on this, is that there is no way from here to there. Um, and the benefit of some of the other um, systems that are being proposed, uh, that are mentioned, some of which are mentioned in your paper, which are band-aids, right, to stick on top of the, the corporate um, initiatives like SBTI that are already out there. Um, the benefit of those is that they have incremental steps that companies can take today, tomorrow, the next day. And um, we work, I work quite a lot with companies trying desperately to secure good um, upstream information about their products from suppliers and have been doing so for many years and the information that they can obtain is very poor. And so getting on a worldwide basis, um, a system in place where you are receiving trusted information that you, can act that, that you actually can and should take as a liability onto your, onto your balance sheet, I, I don't know how to begin. It is, it is so far from where we are because the emissions are happening in places where the companies do not have the information to communicate. So if you have a solution to that, I would love to. Yeah, we're all <laughs> chomping at the bit. Mark's like, can I take this? I want to take it. Julie wants to take it. I'm going to hand it to Mark. There is The good news is there is an answer to that question that we are enthusiastic about. I'm going to pass it to Mark first. Yeah, so it, it, it is a great question, is how do we get from here to there? And the... Um, like one of the, the um, key pathways is when we have regulatory regimes talking about making reporting mandatory. And so for example, both in the US and Europe, um, particularly in Europe, there have been pushes in the direction of mandatory disclosure. And the challenge is that mandatory disclosure under the greenhouse gas protocol can't work. It cannot be accurate. And the, one of the key features of e-liabilities is that it's actually pretty straightforward to implement if someone will mandate it. And so, for example, if we, if it, and, and it's close with the German auto industry to say that e-liabilities are going to be required. And the way they intend to do, or the way you know, it's in discussion to do this, is to simply say, okay, look, you have three years to get actual upstream data from your direct supplier. Because remember, one of the key features of e-liability accounting is you only need your direct suppliers. GHG scope three upstream requires you estimate you know, forever when people don't know it. So like the notion that Samsung can figure out who their tier three suppliers are is just fictional. And the idea that they could estimate their emissions is fictional. But if we all, if, if, if some regulatory regime said the, you know, 
you are required to use e-liabilities in three years. If you're not using reported e-liabilities, then we're going to stick you with the 90th percentile for what the estimate could be. And that would give very large incentives to suppliers providing accurate information because otherwise they know they're getting penalized and their customers are getting penalized because they're not providing the information. So, you know, in, or, you know, as it's just another example in a, in, we could imagine a situation where basically if Amazon and Walmart said, we're only selling stuff that has e-liabilities, it's done. They sell everything. Um, but the, the point is right now, we don't have any hope of getting real data under the GHG protocol. People are guessing, they're estimating, they are using data that, you know, no one has any ability to evaluate, to attest to, to audit. And they are, um, it, it in essence disincentivizes anyone changing their supply chain because if Julian, Alicia and I are all producing the same product and you're our, you're our potential customer. I'm not going to, I'm not going to spend more money to make my product more expensive to be able to sell it to you with lower embodied emissions when Alicia and Julian's companies benefit from me bringing down the industry average. It's, it's like convoluted incentives. So admittedly, we ideally through even uh, mandatory reporting regimes can get very close to e-liability accounting in a supply chain pretty darn quickly. And I, I'm going to pile on Cedric. I see your hand up, but just quickly before we have to wait for regulators, although as Mark said, there are, there are ones that are that are close on the horizon in Europe. Also, as you look to implementation of CBAM, you, you have to start doing e-liability. You can't do scopes yeah. for and anything that has um, fiscal you know policy implications. But there's 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 something even closer on the horizon, which is bilateral supplier contracts. There are companies, large yeah. companies, that are already implementing e-liabilities. There is now an e-liability institute that exists for the sole purpose of piloting and writing guidance around the implementation of e-liabilities. And large companies across all sectors now of the economy who see this solution as so much more rational and efficacious than what they're doing, where they can actually make capital allocation decisions with real information who are implementing this in portions of their supply chain. And the other good news that I will add is there is increasingly now technology to support this that just didn't exist at the time, you know, of, of in, early implementation of the protocol. So you've got, you know, as, as our colleague Karthik likes to say, perhaps the most and only socially beneficial use of distributed ledgers, but, you know, you've got a, a blockchain AI, you've got the, the, the infrastructure of technology to be able to capture this information from cradle to gate. There have been um, advances through other social movements, particularly around de deforestation, where you know Unilever now has the ability to track green attributes, green tokens from you know smallholder farmers to the first mill, that first mile that didn't exist five years ago. So there's there is now technology to to transfer this information through complex global supply chains and retain it through SAP systems, the large. Um, ERP providers are, you know, have these green tokens now as part of their product offering. So, um, and then this question about data, as Mark said, there is no incentive to get actual data right now. Um, in fact, in some ways there's perverse incentive, you know, not to. And so once you start uh, aligning incentive for improvements in emissions intensities, uh, then you then you, you also improve the incentive to, to be able to capture that data. So data is an issue regardless, but under an e-liability system, an ELM um, framework, you have the incentives aligned to improve the data. Cedric, thanks for your patience. Thank you. Um, thank you, Julia, for a, a great uh, presentation. Uh, first, a little remark. Uh, Alicia, at the beginning, I think you mentioned there's three small schools that are collaborating. I think there is like the most prestigious uh, French uh, academic institution that uh, exists. Uh, I, I know that Julia was like, humble, but I, I want to establish the truth on that. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for correcting the record. I appreciate that. 
<laughs> yeah, I think she's like a Polytechnique or NS and NSA and those are those three small things. I'm like, okay. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, super nice talk. I'm I'm curious on your slide 12, uh, Julien, where you were uh, uh, showing the projection uh, that all these oil companies are reporting. Where are the calculations coming from? How are uh, these projections calculated? Uh, when the, you mean when they define their climate targets? Um... Correct, yeah. Um, so basically, the end, yeah. So it's one of the weaknesses that we identify in current practice is that companies has to uh, estimate their future activity and so their future emissions, and so that's why it's surrounded by a lot of uncertainty. Okay. So uh, it's one of yeah, it's uh, it can be illustrated with a central planning issue. So basically, it requires a lot of assumption, and there has to be aligned with one pathway. But several pathways can be uh, possible for firms to be aligned with the same carbon budget. I see. So I, I, what I understand is that you're proposing uh, an accounting-like framework, obviously, to uh, talk about these uh, emissions, right? Uh, and and uh... ELM. And then with ELM, uh, companies don't have to refer to a specific scenario. Just uh, the principle is uh, matching uh, assets with e assets with e liabilities. Correct. And, so, and so one of the questions that arise kind of naturally is that equally as uh, in you know I'd say traditional accounting, uh, how how do you address uh, fraud in in this uh, kind of system? Because obviously uh, you kind of rely on the ability to audit. There is a, a whole you know, kind of uh, CPAs that are available to uh, do these kind of uh, assessment for uh, accounting. But in, in, in the framework that you're proposing, um, I feel like in any kind of accounting, you open yourself to fraud or uh, wrong reporting. How, how do you address uh, those issues? Or is this something you're thinking about? Oh, I mean, with the e liability systems of so firms uh, estimate accurately uh, their carbon emissions. And this is not the case of the current uh, methods proposed by the GSG protocol. Yeah. So with the e liability system and uh, ELM, uh, companies uh, can be audited easily on whether uh, uh, regarding their e liabilities. M much, of the, much of the work um, of the e liability institute is sort of laying the um, pathways for um, audit firms to be able to give you know fair and accurate audits of e liabilities. The challenge I was having a discussion with someone about this earlier. The challenge with the current GHG protocol um, uh, emissions counting, since we refuse to call it accounting, um, is that the best any auditing firm is willing to do is say um, they'll they will they will give it a this is not obviously fraud and you know the the point of e liability accounting is that we can get it to the point where it is de determined as fair and accurate by an auditing firm because it is you know happening you know, in, in transferring liabilities from party to party in a trackable, verifiable way. Please join me in thanking Julian. Great presentation. Thank you all for your great questions and engagement. And we look forward to continuing the conversation.